Welcome to Norse Mythology, the unofficial guide. It's unofficial because I'm neither a credentialed academic nor a time-traveling medieval Norse pagan, but I deal with this material directly from the sources, interpreted through the lens of the experts and their opinions. If you're looking for depth and detail in a simple and accessible way, then you're in the right place. Thar kemmer in dimmi drekki flugandi, nather thron, neither fro nither fjollum, ber ser i fjollrum flugur wall uver, nith hoger noi, nu mun hon sukvask. What I've just recited is the final stanza of the poem Voluspa. And forgive me for doing this, but today I'm not going to explain what it means until the very end of the episode. And we've got a long one today, so by then, you will probably have forgotten about the fact that I even recited it at all. So let's not waste any more time and just dive right in. Back in episode 5, we talked about how time works in Norse mythology. And I made a statement to the effect that, whereas some people will tell you they aren't sure whether or not Ragnarok has already happened, I am sure, and it has not. Ragnarok wasn't a metaphorical idea in the minds of the ancient Norse. It signified the very real end of the current age of gods and humans, including a very literal destruction of the world. But today we're going to add a layer of nuance to that idea. Rather than saying Ragnarok hasn't happened yet, what might be a little more accurate to say is that Ragnarok is currently in process and just hasn't finished yet. The big world-ending battle described in the sources has not yet occurred, but if we take a closer look at what the word Ragnarok actually means, we'll discover that it's a bit bigger than just this idea of a single event or a single battle. You've probably heard the word translated in a few different ways. Fate of the gods, doom of the gods, twilight of the gods, maybe even fate of the powers if you have a slightly more faithful translation. So let's start by getting a better sense of what this word really means. What we call in English Ragnarok shows up in two different forms in our sources, both as Ragnarok and as Ragnarökker. The easy part is the component Ragna, which is what we call a genitive form of the word Regen. Regen gets used throughout the sources as a reference to the gods, but more literally it can be defined as a council of ruling powers. So, Regen means the powers, and its genitive form, Ragna, means of the powers. Now we have to deal with Rok and Rukkar. So, let's take the easy one first. Rukkar means twilight. Ragna Rukkar, then, literally means twilight of the powers. The usage of twilight in this context seems really poetic to the modern ear, so people latch on to this definition pretty frequently. It's also the version we find commonly used in Snorri's Prose Edda from the 1200s, as well as in a stanza from the poem Lokasenna. But Rudolf Zemeck asserts that this version is actually a later evolution of the term, and even goes so far as to call it wrongly used. The older and more correct version, at least according to Zemeck, is Ragnarok. Now, rok is a weird word. It's related to the English word rake, but doesn't have the same meaning. Rok is actually a plural word, and it can refer to things like judgments or sentences. For example, Voluspa 6 uses the word rokstola to mean judgment seats. It can also refer to past events or bygones, as we see in Lokasena 25, when Frigg advises Odin and Loki not to talk about their forn rok, their events of the past. And it can refer to the culmination of something, as in the phrase alda rok, which seems to mean the end of an age in Vafthruth and Small 39. Another of its meanings, which is reasoning or grounds or arguments, has carried on into modern Icelandic, relatively intact. It has a reconstructed origin in Proto-Germanic, which is rako, and it appears to have meant something like a path or a course or a direction. So I'm going to propose a unified definition for this word that I think satisfies all of these usages. In my mind, Rok can be universally defined as things that follow each other in a progression, such as moments in a narrative, steps on a path, the logical flow of points in an argument, events in a person's life, the unfolding of fate, or anything else like that. Rok are the sequential pieces that make up a sequence, things that flow in a particular direction, 
And oftentimes, there's a particular emphasis on the final end piece where all of these things are leading. So in that case, although Ragnarok is often translated as fate of the gods, a less glossy translation might be something like the course of events of the powers. It's a fated journey that ultimately culminates with the end of an age, and we have not yet reached the end of that age. But if Ragnarok is a progression of events, the trick is nailing down the moment where Ragnarok begins. Most of us wouldn't feel comfortable describing Ragnarok as something that began all the way back when the world was created, and when the word is used in the sources, the emphasis is placed pretty strongly on the end of the progression. With that said, there are a few events that have to occur before the final epic battle between gods and Jotnar. And some of these, such as the death of Baldur, the fettering of Fenrir, and the binding of Loki, are described as having already happened at some point in the past. Others are yet to come. So, if we want to look at Ragnarok more broadly as a course of events that tie together the fates of the gods, we can easily say that Ragnarok is already underway. If we want to place our emphasis on the end, then we still have a lot to look forward to, for lack of a better way of saying that. Snorri describes all these events in Gilvaginning in the Prose Edda as a lead-up to the actual physical present, the time we're living in now, and from here, he moves on to what mankind can expect to come in the future. So as we dig into those events, let's try and put together a cohesive narrative for events as they are described both in Snorri's version and in the poetic sources. I'm going to try my best to keep this from getting confusing, because the details are kind of scattered and they don't exactly agree from source to source. In the conversation between Gangleri and the three wizards in the Prose Edda, Gangleri has just been told that Loki currently lies chained by his son's guts in a cave and that he will have to stay that way until Ragnarok. Gangleri then mentions that he's never heard of Ragnarok before and asks to know what there is to be told about it. The wizards begin by explaining that we ought to expect at least six years' worth of winter-related problems coming in the future. To begin, there will be three winters containing great battles throughout the world, characterized by the breaking of kinship bonds and brothers killing each other over greed. As evidence for this interpretation, the wizards quote Voluspa stanza 44, quote, Brother will fight brother and be his slayer. Sister's sons will violate the kinship bond. Hard it is in the world. Whoredom abounds. Axe age. Sword age. Shields are cleft asunder. Wind age. Wolf age. Before the world plunges headlong, no man will spare another. End quote. Following these three winters, the wizards say the world will have to endure an even harsher winter event called Fimbulvetr, which just means mighty winter. Fimbulvetr is believed to last for the length of three winters all on its own, but with no summer in between, which brings our sum total of years characterized by winter-related problems up to six. During this time, there will be great frosts and harsh winds and snow coming in from all directions, with the sun doing absolutely no good at all. Much of mankind is apparently expected to die during this time as the poem Vafthrudnismal contains a short discussion between Odin and the Jotun Vafthrudnir about specifically which humans will survive when Fimbulvetr occurs. And the answer is that there are just two, who will be saved in a place called Hodmimus Holt. But we'll come back to this. For now, let's pause for a second and jump way back in time to about 536 AD, which is more than 350 years before the Viking Age began. In either 535 or 536, some volcano went off somewhere, exactly when and where is debated, and it triggered an event that has come to be known as the Volcanic Winter of 536. We know this because its effects were written about by people in Rome and Syria and Ireland, and even places as far away as China and Peru, among others. And those effects included things like snow in the summertime, widespread crop failures, prolonged drought, frosts at harvest time, and all the things we might expect when the sun gets blocked out by volcanic ash for too long. Archaeological evidence seems to show a lot of social upheaval and migration in the northern countries during this time as well, including things like completely abandoned settlements and whatnot. 
And all of this has led to a very popular theory that the volcanic winter of 536 either was the Fimbulvetr of Norse mythology or was the inspiration for that myth. But the problem is, comparative mythology may tell another story. Anders Hultgard notes that the Scandinavian myth of the Great Winter may well be Indo-European in origin, in other words, potentially more than 5,000 years old. He points in particular to similarities found between Great Winter myths in both the Norse tradition and the Iranian tradition, and explains that whereas some scholars in the past have tried to explain this away as a borrowing from Iranian mythology into Norse mythology, that type of diffusion wouldn't have made a lot of sense historically. In his mind, a common origin is a better explanation. On the other side of the argument are scholars like Bo Grasslund, who, because they don't fully buy into the Indo-European origin of this particular myth, are looking for something else that can explain why both the Norse and Iranian traditions contain corresponding details. And they tend to settle on the idea that the volcanic winter of 536 and its surrounding effects must have caused similarities to arise in both traditions. But here are some of those similarities. Three consecutive winters, missing summers, an age characterized by moral decay and war, most of mankind being killed in the process, a near-paradisiacal renewing of the earth coming afterwards, and repopulation happening by way of a few humans who have been preserved in some kind of an enclosure during the cataclysm. To be clear, the way I've presented these similarities might make it seem like the Iranian narrative more closely mirrors the Norse narrative than it really does. So keep in mind, we're not dealing with stories that are immediately so similar at face value. But to me, the fact that all of these key similarities do exist is telling. And I'm much more inclined to believe that there is an ancient Indo-European origin to this idea. With all that said, we could certainly talk about how much a pre-existing narrative might have been influenced by the events in 536. It would be hard to imagine a society who believed in an upcoming cataclysmic winter wouldn't have made any connection at all between their beliefs and an actually occurring wintry catastrophe. But I personally think the idea itself is older. The next few events that kick off the fated cataclysm are a bit jumbled. Some of them are repeated a couple of times in Voluspa in between various other events, and overall they seem to occur a little earlier in Voluspa than they do in Snorri's version in the Prosetta. So the exact order probably isn't all that important, but we get a description of a rooster crowing, a dog named Garmer who is traditionally thought of as guarding the gates of hell beginning to bark, and the god Heimdallr blowing on the Gjallarhorn. What would be nice is if these events had come with any more additional description, but alas, they do not. The world tree, Yggdrasil, begins to shake, and someone who Voluspa calls the Jotun will get free. My best guess as to who this is, is probably Loki. Even though he's referred to as a god and a member of the Asir throughout the sources, it's important to remember that the only real difference between a god and a Jotun is really whether or not you are a member of the Asir clan. And Loki has, for all intents and purposes, been cast out of the clan already at this point, being bound in a cave for the rest of our current age until this very event. We'll also see Loki running around unchained in just a moment, so it makes sense that he gets free around this time anyway. Of course, it's not just Loki who will get free at this point, but the monstrous wolf Fenrir as well. How exactly they both get free is kind of mysterious. But in my own headcanon, I tie all this back to the mention of Yggdrasil shaking. Loki's painful writhing under the dripping of serpent venom is what causes earthquakes, if you'll recall. So I like to sort of imagine maybe one particularly violent earthquake is finally enough to shake these bound characters free of their bonds. But however it happens, with Loki and Fenrir free, the Jotnar are ready to launch their attack. And it begins with a ship. According to Voluspa, the great sea serpent Jormungandr begins writhing around in a rage, and an unnamed eagle shrieks in anticipation of the battle to come, and it tears into an unnamed corpse. All of which seems to result somehow in a ship called Nagalfar breaking free of its moorings. My best guess as to who that eagle is, is that maybe this is Hrasvelger, who is mentioned in the poem Vathrudnismal, 
If you aren't already aware, Hrasvelger is actually a Jotun sitting at the end of heaven in the form of an eagle, and when he flaps his wings, it's the origin of the wind. The imagery here makes it sound like Nagelfar has been chained up somewhere in such a way that it takes some great churning of the waves by the world serpent and possibly some weird corpse tearing action or maybe actually some strong wind produced by the eagle's wings in the process in order for the ship to get loose. The poet asserts that both a Jotun named Hrimmer, not to be confused with Skrimmer and Thrimmer, and the ship Nagelfar will push in from the east. So presumably Hrimmer is aboard the ship, but he's not steering. The ship is being steered by Loki, and it's filled with an army of Muspel's troops, or in other words, Jotnar, and they're all advancing at the same time as Fenrir. In the Prose Edda, Snorri tells us that a ship named Nagalfari, with an extra I on the end, is the biggest of all ships, and that it belongs to the Jotun Muspel, who, based on his name, appears to be the ruler over the region sometimes called Muspelheim. Later on, Snorri starts calling this ship Nagalfar, without the extra I on the end, and explains to us that the ship is made of dead people's nails, as in fingernails and toenails. He warns that if you die with untrimmed nails, you will be contributing to the material this ship is made from, so make sure to keep your nails tidy. This, of course, is yet another blow to the idea that Ragnarok has already happened, given that the ship is still under construction. Snorri notes that, quote, gods and men wish it would take a long time to finish, end quote. The implication being that it isn't done yet. But whereas Voluspa tells us that Loki will be steering Nagalfar, Snorri tells us it will be captained by Hrimmer. He doesn't place Loki on the ship directly, but he does explain that at some point, quote, Loki will also have arrived there, and Hrimmer and with him all the frost giants, but with Loki will be all Hell's people, end quote. So in a way, he's still keeping Loki and Hrimmer together, but also setting them up as leaders of different armies. The so-called Frost Giants will be with Hrimmer and therefore presumably arrived on the boat, as we saw the army of Muspel's troops doing in Voluspa. But now, Loki is found in company with a group Snorri calls Hell's People. One interesting thing to point out is that this is the one and only reference to any sort of participation by Loki's daughter Hel in the events of this final battle. She never appears on the scene in any narrative, and this group called Hell's People are immediately forgotten by Snorri and never mentioned again. We don't know exactly who they are, specifically how they will arrive, or what their role in the battle will be. Are they some kind of anti einherjar We can't say. Are they a group of dead humans, or possibly some kind of trolls or Jotnar from Niflheimer? Sadly, we just can't say. At this point, Jormungandr's movements cause the ocean to surge up onto the land as he slithers his way up onto the shore. Snorri adds in a detail that he will be spitting enough poison to completely bespatter the sky and sea as he does so. Meanwhile, Fenrir will be lumbering across the landscape like some kind of eldritch horror, as Snorri describes it, now so absurdly enormous that as he goes forth with his mouth agape, his upper jaw will be touching the sky and his lower jaw dragging across the ground, and he's going to have flames burning out from his eyes and nostrils. Just stop for a second and imagine that. A wolf who, based on what his mouth is doing must essentially be the size of a mountain, at least, and with fire coming all out of his face and stuff, on his way to murder the gods, while his even larger sea serpent brother is spraying venom all over the sky, which surely must also then be raining down all over the world and killing everybody. It'd be pretty hard to miss this, and not exactly the kind of thing you'd want to be around for. Voluspa explains that all of Jotunheimer roars as the Asir take counsel together, and the dwarves start to groan. Odin also takes this opportunity to speak with the disembodied head of Mimir, but we don't get any insight into how that conversation goes. And then suddenly, the sky itself is cloven apart, and the Jotun Surtur, who typically stands as a guard at the border of Muspelheim, comes up from the south, carrying fire and a sword blazing with light brighter than the sun. In Snorri's version, Sortur actually comes out from the cloven sky, leading the sons of Muspel, and they attempt to advance across the rainbow bridge, Bivrost, but their collective weight breaks it, forcing them to continue their advance over land. Another short version in the poem Falvnismal actually has Bivrost breaking as the gods try to cross it, leaving their horses to flounder in a great river. 
Overall, conditions are terrible, says the composer of Voluspa. Mountains collapse, troll women are abroad, and people are walking the hell road, or in other words, dying from all the calamity. Snorri asserts that it's actually at this moment when Heimdallr finally blows his horn, as the final clash of armies is about to commence. He also adds a detail that when Odin counsels with Mimir's head, he rides to Mimir's well to do it, indicating that Snorri doesn't think Odin is carrying this head around with him all the time. Snorri next describes a scene wherein all of our heroes and villains, all the gods in Jotnar, meet at a field called Vigridr, which means, like, killing place. This is the name of the field as given in Vathrudnismal as well, where we are also told that it is 100 rests in size. That is, 100 times the distance you would travel before resting, and this is both in length and in width. But it's worth noting that Favnismal says the battle will take place on an island called Oskopnir. So maybe it's a field on an island. But even here, it's like the sources are trying to bash into our heads over and over again that Ragnarok hasn't happened yet, as the name of the island Oskopnir apparently means not yet made. As Odin arrives at Vigridr, he will be dressed in fine mail, wearing a golden helmet and carrying the spear Gungnir. And in fact, all of the Asir will be decked out in their war gear as well. Odin will also have his army of Ein Heriar with him. These are the souls of those who have died in battle, or otherwise found some way to end up in Valhol upon death, as we described back in episode 11. And together, they will all charge the field. But it's not long before what Voluspa calls Hlin's second sorrow occurs, as Odin engages with Fenrir, and is finally consumed by the wolf. Snorri makes it a point to mention that this happens because Thor is unable to help, since he will have his hands full fighting with his old nemesis, Jormungandr. Likewise, Freyr will engage in battle with Surtur, but because he no longer has his magic sword that he gave to Skirnir in exchange for marriage to the girl with the shiniest arms, after a fierce conflict, Freyr will fall as well. In another battle occurring at more or less the same time, the dog Gormr, who Snorri tells us is a most evil creature, will have gotten free from his chains in front of the cave called Gnipaheller, and will be engaging with Tyr. The fight isn't described in detail, because why would it be? But both Tyr and Garmer will kill each other. But now Odin's son Vidar enters the fray to avenge his father. Vidar is a character who doesn't feature heavily in the sources. You may recall that in Lokasena, Odin asked him to give up his seat for Loki to have a chair at the feast. We're also told in a few places that Vidar's most recognizable trait is that he is silent. It's not exactly clear whether this means he never speaks at all, or if he's maybe just a quiet guy, but it's true that he has no dialogue in any story. And it's also true that Vidar is about to perform one of the most epic deeds described at Ragnarok. After Odin goes down the gullet, Vidar will lunge at Fenrir, placing one of his feet on the wolf's lower jaw. And on this foot, Vidar will be wearing a very special shoe that has been crafted from all the waist pieces from all other shoes made throughout all of time, specifically all the scraps cut from the toe and the heel. Snorri mentions that anyone who wishes to give assistance to the Asir during this battle should make sure to throw these pieces away whenever they make shoes. It's interesting because he's now given us a way to help the Jotnar by dying with untrimmed nails and a way to help the Asir by throwing away the scraps from your shoe, and both of them are interestingly sort of related to feet and toes, which is kind of fascinating. But the way this shoe is made is probably supposed to tell us that it is extremely thick and durable, which is probably meant to give Vidar's foot some protection against Fenrir's teeth. So with his foot holding Fenrir's lower jaw to the ground, he will grab the upper jaw with just one hand, and then, with some impressive godly strength near on the order of Thor's, he will tear Fenrir's mouth apart, finally causing the death of the wolf. Or so says Snorri. In Voluspa's version, Vidar simply stabs Fenrir in the heart. So, do you believe the poetry, or do you believe Snorri? What's interesting is that we actually have a depiction of this scene represented on the Gosforth Cross from the 900s AD, and it shows Vidar with a foot on Fenrir's lower jaw and a single hand on his upper jaw. So it would seem that the archaeology vindicates Snorri once again. 
Although keep in mind, in reality, various versions of this story would have been circulating around in the pre-Christian era. It's not necessarily true that there's one version that's right and another version that's wrong. Also later on, Snorri gives us a kenning for Vidar, which calls him the possessor of the Iron Shoe. So the details are always a little muddy. As these fights are occurring, Thor, of course, will have been battling at Jormungandr. Volospa mentions that as their battle commences, quote, all men must abandon their homesteads, end quote. This is the kind of fight that can't fully be contained to one field somewhere. It's big enough that everyone in the world will be forced to flee for one reason or another. And eventually, Thor will be victorious. But once he finally defeats the serpent, he will be able to take only nine steps forward before falling over dead himself. And Snorri clarifies that this will be due to his exposure to the serpent's venom that he suffers during their battle. The last described fight occurs between Heimdallr and Loki. And true to frustrating form, our sources don't give us any details at all about how that fight is expected to go. All we have is one line from Snorri that Heimdallr and Loki will both kill each other. And then finally, with Odin, Thor, Freyr, Heimdallr, and Loki all dead, Sorter will fling fire over the whole earth, incinerating absolutely everything, and causing the destroyed earth to sink into the sea, presumably taking everything built by the gods along with it. Steam rises as flame meets water, and finally the commotion ends. There's another important piece to this puzzle that I haven't touched on yet specifically because it comes in three separate versions, and it's hard to figure out exactly how to properly merge it into the rest of the narrative. I'm talking, of course, about what happens to the sun and the moon. In Voluspa stanzas 54-56, the sun turns black and sinks into the sea, which is in contradiction to Snorri's version in the Prose Edda, where he asserts that, quote, the wolf will swallow the sun, and, quote, the other wolf will catch the moon. Presumably, he's referring to two wolves named Skoll and Hati, who chase the sun and the moon across the sky, according to the poem Grimnismal. Snorri adds that these wolves were raised by a Jotun woman who breeds the monstrous offspring of Fenrir in an eastern place called Ironwood. A third account from Vafthrudnismal explains that Fenrir himself will snatch down the sun, but that someone called Alfrodul, which in this context is probably just another name for the sun goddess Sol, has a daughter, who will subsequently carry it back into the sky. The concept of which wolf or dog is which gets really muddy really quickly when you start digging into it. There are some reasons to theorize that Skull might actually be another name for Fenrir, or that Gormer might even be Fenrir as well, and there are reasons to theorize that this woman in Ironwood might be Loki's mistress Angerboda, which would bring in some incestuous implications with the way she ended up with Fenrir's offspring that I think are probably too ambiguous to get into here. But it's a wide, weird world of wolves in the Norse mythological sources. So at this point, the Earth has been destroyed, and we've been told the names of a few characters who have died in the battle, or even well before the battle, such as Baldr and his brother Hother. But there are plenty of characters who haven't been mentioned at all, most of which will not be mentioned in the rest of the story, leaving us to speculate about whether or not any of them have died or managed to survive. The fates of all the goddesses, for example, apart from Sol the Sun Goddess, are left unsatisfyingly up to the imagination. It's even unclear what exactly happened to Yggdrasil. Did it burn up? Did it sink into the sea? We get one clue in Voluspa 45, when we're given the following phrase— Mjotuder kundisk at innu galla gjallarhorni, or in English, Mjotuder is kindled at the resounding of the gjallarhorn. The first problem, of course, is with the word Mjotuder, which means like the measurer, in the sense of a judge or a dispenser of fate, something like that. It comes from the same root as the word used in stanza two, when the seeress tells us she remembers the mighty measuring tree, the Mjotvider, below the earth, which we typically assume is a reference to Yggdrasil. So, is Mjotuder the same thing as the tree? Does this mean the tree is set on fire? If so, are we to understand that somehow the sound of the Gjallarhorn is somehow lighting it on fire? Or does this mean something more poetic, like the sound of the Gjallarhorn echoes out the sound of fate itself? Or is Heimdallr, the one blowing the horn, being named as the Mjotuder? 
it's a tricky one. So accepting what we don't know, let's move on to what we do. Having been burned and sunk by Surtur's fire, the earth now emerges once again out of the sea, luscious and green. But according to Voluspa, it's not exactly the same as it was before. This time, it's eternally green, with gorgeous plunging waterfalls and replete with soaring eagles and plentiful fish. The fields grow without needing to be sown, and all evils are healed from the earth. In this context, the word translated to evils is more literally translated to bales, so basically anything that causes sorrow and strife. It's a paradise, quite a bit different from the world we live in now. And at this point, we can start putting together a list of the gods who will be present in the world after the cataclysm. First and foremost, Baldr and Hother are able to triumphantly come back from the dead. How, you ask? Has something happened to Hell? Is she gone? Has she given them special permission to return to the world of the living for some reason? I bet you can guess the answer by now. It's that we have absolutely no idea. The point is that a new age begins here, and all the rules and structures established in the previous age presumably no longer apply. Maybe death and the afterlife work differently now. Maybe Hell's domain is completely destroyed along with the rest of the Earth, and maybe she gets killed. Feel free to add this to your list of things to speculate about. And while we're on the topic of unanswerable questions, a world without bales seems to imply a world without Jotnar and trolls and whatnot. It's entirely possible that the very beings who will set the Earth ablaze will also be unable to survive their own destructive forces. But if so, why destroy themselves? Is it accidental? We'll probably never know. But having returned from the dead, Baldr and Hother will meet a host of the surviving Asir in a field called Idhvolr, where they will discover, laying in the grass, a game board with golden pieces once used by the prior generation of gods before any troubles on earth ever began. The other survivors, according to an aggregated list given to us in pieces by Snorri, Voluspa, and Vafthrudnismal, include Vidar, Vali, Modi, Magni, and Hunir. Everyone else, as well as all the Inheriar and nearly all of mankind, are presumably dead. Together, the remaining gods discuss old times and build new settlements. Thor's sons Modi and Magni inherit his legendary hammer, and Hunir takes up the practice of prophesying with bits of wood. A new hall is built at Gimla, where worthy lords dwell, living out their lives in happiness. Vafthrud the Small 49 adds something obscure and cryptic here about three rivers and three women with protective spirits who were raised among Jotnar, but I'm not even going to begin to try and explain what it's talking about. Finally, Nidhogr, the dark dragon who gnaws on the corpses of the evil dead beneath Yggdrasil, will appear coming up from underneath Nidhafjol, the dark mountains of the underworld, and flying over the plain carrying corpses. And then, having finished her prophecy, the seeress narrating Voluspa sinks back down into what is probably her grave. So goes the course of the powers. Outside of Voluspa, we are told who among humanity will survive the cataclysm. Vafthruth in Small 45 explains that exactly two humans, named Liv and Livthrasir, will survive by hiding in a place called Hodmimus Holt, subsisting entirely on morning dew, which sounds pretty and poetic, but is not super satisfying if you imagine yourself having to live on nothing but dew. Leave and leave Thrasir mean respectively life and something like one who fights for life. Zemek and Larrington, and actually a lot of others, tend to agree that this place where leave and leave Thrasir hide, Hodmimus Holt, is likely a reference to Yggdrasil itself, although in Larrington's interpretation, Yggdrasil is supposed to have caught on fire at some point. But she does concede that the sources aren't very clear about what ultimately happens to the tree. One misconception you'll sometimes find online is that Liv and Liv Thrasir are the same two individuals as Oscar and Embla, who were originally found on a beach as pieces of driftwood shortly after the creation of the world, and given life by Odin and his brothers. In order for this misconception to be true, Ragnarok would have had to have happened before the creation of humanity, which obviously it didn't. But even though these two couples aren't the same, it is interesting that both pairs sort of emerge from trees in some way at the beginning of their respective ages. Plus, as we mentioned way back in episode 2, 
Iceland seems to have been deforested within the first few generations of Norse settlers, and so this idea of making things out of driftwood hints at being a particularly Icelandic version of the story. The Roman senator Tacitus wrote in the first century about a Germanic group he called the Semnones, who believed that they originated from a grove of trees. So this idea that humanity comes forth from trees in some way appears to be very old in Germanic mythology. And in this case, it's from Liv and Livthrasir that the next generations of humanity will flow. The Hauksbok version of Voluspa also contains an interesting piece of information that doesn't appear in the Codex Regius version. It's stanza 59 in Larrington's appendix, and her translation is about as literal as we can get. Quote, then comes the Mighty One to the judgment of the powers, full of strength, from above, he who rules over all, end quote. Larrington's footnote about this stanza mentions that it may refer either to the return of Baldr or to a coming of Jesus Christ that will, quote, displace the post-Ragnarok order among the gods, end quote. In my own opinion, this stanza gives off strong Christianity vibes. The detail that this new ruler comes in from above stands out to me as being out of place with the way various types of return from death typically work in other Norse sources, but it's clearly right in line with how Christianity conceptualizes the second coming of Christ. There is very likely some amount of Christian influence present in some of these stories that were still evolving as the pagan period waned and were only written down by Christians in later years. But it's also important not to create a headcanon and then disregard anything that contradicts our headcanon on the assumption of Christian influence. There's plenty of information in the narrative that seems reminiscent of Christian concepts, but as long as that information is also reminiscent of broad Indo-European mythological concepts, then we will need a better reason to discard it. So, to start kind of wrapping things up here, let's talk about a really common question people tend to start asking right after digesting the whole Ragnarok narrative. I've already touched on a few that are just impossible to answer, but this one warrants a little discussion because the sources do give us a couple of clues. And the question is, are the dead gods permanently dead? And what does it mean for a god to be dead anyway? Vafthrudnismal 47 describes Ragnarok as a time, quote, Tho er regin doya, literally, when the gods die. Hynluljoth uses the phrase rogen of thryoti, meaning the gods come to an end. Fjolsvinsmal 14, Sigurdrifumal 19, Lokasena 41, Grimnismal 4, and Vafthrudnismal 52 all use the phrase ryufaskregen, which means in this context something along the lines of the gods are destroyed. I personally read this altogether as being an idea of permanence. Additionally, as I mentioned, Vafthruth the Small 51 asserts that Modi and Magni will have Mjolnir after Searcher's Fire is slaked. If there was some idea that Thor wasn't really gone, or that he could still have some kind of influence in the world, it would be really strange for the sources to transfer ownership of his hammer over to his sons. But this is all the information we really have. In terms of why a death like Baldur's wasn't permanent, but Thor's, for example, might be, we don't know for sure. Maybe it has something to do with one age ending and another beginning with a new generation of gods set to take over the mantle of the previous ones. Maybe it has to do with the fact that Baldur's death is a wrong that needs to be righted, whereas the other gods have misdeeds to answer for. Mythology isn't designed to abide by a structured system of logical rules, so any speculative answer is essentially just as good as any other. The last thing I want to mention is the common discussion about whether or not we ought to expect another Ragnarokish cataclysm to befall the world at the end of the next stage of humanity. And this is where things get a little dicey. In my opinion, there are two ways we can look at it. On the one hand, there's an answer we can derive from little hints and clues in the sources, and from mythological information found in related traditions. On the other hand, there's an answer we can derive from the direct information as it was recorded in the sources that have survived. So first, let's talk about the clues. Indo-European religions very commonly feature cyclical ages of destruction and renewal. 
Just from this fact alone, we could surmise that the Norse tradition at least evolved out of something older that probably featured a similar system. There's also this idea that mankind emerges from trees in some way at the beginning of our age and then emerges again from trees at the beginning of the next one. It would seem to hint at a repeatable pattern. And given that so much of ancient Norse life revolved around the cyclical patterns of the sun and moon and seasons, and the fact that reincarnation shows up here and there allowing people to live lives over and over again, wouldn't a non-cyclical timeline be weirdly out of the ordinary for this type of mindset? But we also have to contend with the actual information recorded in the sources. Keep in mind that in the very beginning, there was nothing but an empty yawning void until Odin and his brothers first created the sea from Ymir's blood and the earth from Ymir's corpse. When the earth sinks into the sea at the end of Ragnarok, we should remember that this is the same sea that was created with Ymir's blood, and when it rises back out again from that same sea, it has not needed to be rebuilt by the hands of a god. There's no second act of creation, if that makes sense. This would imply that there were probably no prior ages, since before the creation of the world there was nothing. And since an act of creation is not necessary to start the world again after it's destroyed at Ragnarok, we're not exactly seeing a repeat of what happened before. The pre-Ragnarok world we live in now is also pretty far from the utopia described in Voluspa that will come after Ragnarok is over. With all bales removed from the earth, it would seem that we are lacking the conditions necessary for another cataclysm to occur further down the road. And then, of course, there's the problem that not once in any surviving source is the idea of a cyclical timeline of destruction and renewal ever actually described. Say what you want about Christian influence in Voluspa, but such a fundamental idea is pretty weird to leave out of every single poem that discusses the history and future of the world. Now, if you don't like this interpretation, and if you spend enough time looking around for somebody giving you reasons to believe that Ragnarok is cyclical— you will eventually stumble upon somebody telling you that the presence of the dragon Nidhogr in the final stanza of Voluspa indicates that there is still evil in the world, and that another cataclysm will therefore come in the future. This is a weirdly popular idea, so let's read that stanza together. In fact, it's the stanza I recited all the way back at the beginning of this episode. Once again, Thor kemmer in dimidreki flugandi, nader fron, neden fra nidafjollum, Per ser i fjodrum flyger vol uver nid hogger noi, nu mun hon sukvask. There comes the gloomy dragon flying, a gleaming serpent, up from beneath Nidafjol. Nidhogger flies over the field, bearing corpses in his feathers. Now she will sink. To me, the idea that this stanza implies a second cataclysm in the future is an extremely presumptuous interpretation of a single stanza wherein Nidhogger simply flies away. For all we know, the reason he flies away is because evil is now gone from the world, and he has no more reason to remain underground sucking on the corpses of evildoers, as he does now, during the first stage. In fact, Zemeck's opinion, which I don't believe is actually a majority opinion in this case, is that this stanza of Voluspa speaks to the, quote, final destruction of Nidhogr. Final destruction isn't the phrase I would use, but I do read it as a likely description of Nidhogr leaving because he no longer has a purpose in the New Age. But even though I don't personally believe the sources are explicitly telling us we should expect a cyclical Ragnarok, I've decided to subvert myself just a little bit by ending this episode with the same stanza that it began. And even though the timeline as it actually exists in the sources ends after presenting us with a renewed Earth after Ragnarok, there's no reason this show has to end the same way. There's still tons of Norse mythology left to explore, so let's continue to go all Viking together next time on Norse Mythology, The Unofficial Guide. Sources for this episode include Dictionary of Northern Mythology by Rudolf Zemeck, 2007, Fimbelvintern Ragnarok och Klimatkrisen, or 536-537, by Bo Grasslund, 2007. Sacred Tree and Holy Grove, by Joseph S. Hopkins, 2020, on mimisbrunner.info. The Mythic Theme of the Great Winter in Ancient Iranian Traditions, by Anders Hultgaard, 2002. The Poetic Edda, translated by Caroline Larrington, 2014. And the Prose Edda, translated by Anthony Falks, 1995.